If I can invite our speakers up, up onto the table here, to the stage, please, we'll uh, start the Q&A. I hope you've been uh, listening and thinking about what probing questions you'd like to ask the panel. We've got some uh, microphones uh, roaming around. Um, when you ask a question, please just tell us who you are and where you're from, just so we've got that context. That would be great for us. And a pithy question, so we've got more time to answer. Who wants to ask the first question? Any takers? I'll, oh, Andy, colleague Andy. Andy Collinson from Steer. Um, I've been lucky enough to work um, with a developer in Leeds and see Kirkstall, work on Kirkstall Station from the original feasibility through to, to its construction. But actually the hardest part was getting the trains to stop there. <laughs> um, and I just wondered whether the panel, you know, we, what we haven't touched on is the fact that for these, particularly for, sta for, for stations that are not terminus stations, you've actually got to build in and persuade a lot of stakeholders to, to deliver a service there. Uh, and I just wonder whether the panel could talk about, you know, touch on how, how, how we can get through that challenge. Thanks, Andy. So beyond the station, developing the station, how do we get the train service to follow through that? To get the utility, the transport utility. Any views? Andrew. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my first engagement in this issue of, 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 uh, of stations as placemakers is when I was a teenager living near a place called uh, Kingham in, uh, in Oxfordshire uh, on, um, on the North Cotswold line, which British Rail was then trying to close. It was trying to close the line. It was systematically degrading the service. Uh, it used one ruse after another. It was actually the reason I became a politician. Actually, I got a, a, a local group going to second-guess British Rail statistics on the use of the line, because they, they were taking the through trains through to Paddington off. I thought I wasn't going to be able to get to school. I mean, it's a sort of fundamental thing about a place where it was a boarding school. And uh, Sir Peter Parker, because uh, when I was 10, the job I wanted to do was to be chairman of British Rail. <laughs> that last British Rail had been abolished by the time I came, it was possible I could do this job, so I became Secretary of State of Transport instead. But I wrote to Sir Peter Parker asking why it was that this, because each year's timetable had a worse service than the previous one, and the crux point is they wanted to take all the through trains off, which it was quite clear even to me as a 13-year-old was obviously going to lead to the closure of the line. And uh, I asked to see the statistics on the use, because they were saying there were, they, somebody had put out a statement saying that people, well, there wasn't enough traffic on the line. <coughs> and his private secretary sent me some statistics, which was very unwise of things. What I did was to get a load of my friends together, and we started going up and down the trains between a place called Kingham and a place called Morton in Marsh to count the number of passengers, which showed that the statistics I'd been given were wrong. And I then engaged in a correspondence with, uh, with Sir Peter Parker about these things. And, uh, and this thing, and it was part of, a, of the setting up of the Cotswold Line Promotion Group, which was one of the very, very first promotion groups for a railway line in the country. And it was supremely successful. Actually, it wasn't as successful as I thought, because the real reason why the, Cot the Cotswold Line was preserved is that it turned out Sir Peter Parker lived on the line. <laughs> He lived at a place called Minster Lovell near Charlby. So there was me thinking it was this great uh, citizen's action that had got the line saved. In fact, it was actually the fact that the chairman of British Rail was willing us on. He probably sent us deliberately false statistics to provoke us, I don't know, which got the thing going. And indeed, there's a memorial to Peter Parker on Charlbury Station now. However, if you look at now and then, there's been an utter, complete transformation in the quality of the service. One of the things I did when I was Transport Secretary was to reopen the doubling of the line with David Cameron, who was the local MP. And, uh, but crucial to it was the systematic upgrading of the stations uh, and uh, community facilities and encouraging British Rail and then after that GWR to open uh, uh, to stations and to provide decent uh, services from them, which is exactly your point. So if you take, for example, Hanborough, which is now a major commuting centre into Oxford, and indeed I was just looking at my good friend Richard Faulkner, who now chair, is president of the Cotswold Line Promotion Group, which is now a massive group with huge numbers of members, all the local authorities and all the others are there now. Not only does it have an hourly station, in an hourly service into Oxford, but there's now a plan to have a half hourly station turning it, uh, service turning it into a, um, a hub, which would then go on to the onto the um, uh, Marylebone to Bicester line to, to Oxford Parkway, which, which Jeremy mentioned, which has been a huge success, which I'm very proud to have done as, as Transport Secretary because we put in the, um, uh, in the investment uh, into the, it, what was then called Evergreen 3, I think was its name, wasn't it, which then led to the opening of that line. And, uh, and there's huge potential there 
Uh, but the, why it's worked, I think, is partly the Cotswold Line Promotion Group, partly local authorities have been very go-ahead there, partly the transport departments um, uh, coming together, looking at the uh, opportunity, which goes well beyond the... Um, uh, the, the narrow confines of, of the existing service. Because if you go back 20 years at Hanborough, Hanborough was a station which very nearly closed. Actually, I, don't, I, just, I agree with almost everything Jeremy said. I don't agree with closing stations. Most of those stations is talking about cost almost nothing to keep open. Hanborough as a station would definitely have been closed 25 years ago if you just looked at numbers. It had one or two trains a day that stopped there. Uh, most of the trains didn't stop there. And British Rail was strongly against stopping more trains there, strongly against. I remember the discussions when we had the guy who was the route director then was coming along to the meeting of the Cotswold Line Promotion Group who told us it would slow all the trains down to Worcester and Hereford. And what he wanted to do, he told us frankly, was to close the station, he said. This is now a station that has huge numbers of passengers, has led to massive development in and around, and is becoming a big commuting centre. So what do you need to do if you want, again, you know, Rob and Duplicate all do the best thing. Every line in the country needs an organisation like the Cotswold Line Promotion Group, <laughs> which is a line and community champion, which doesn't just see this from the viewpoint of the current transport operator, but sees it as a massive um, uh, uh, a railway line, as a massive opportunity for community growth and community regeneration. The problem, of course, was the Cotswold Line Promotion Group has, uh, is, goes to a very wealthy part of the country with lots of, ext I mean, it, I don't know if it's still true, but it used to have, I think, the highest proportion of first-class passengers to passengers of any line in the country. So uh, it's an ideal type. But when we come to Greater Manchester, uh, you don't have that strength of community res resilience and promotion there. So the challenge is, how do you get more organisations like the Cotswold Wine Promotion Group where they can sustain it, but how do local authorities and others do the job where you can't sustain it? Yeah. Th those are my thoughts. Thank you. Jeremy, you want to... Yeah, I, I mean, as I said earlier, I was quite prepared to be a bit um, controversial this evening. I understand only too well how controversial it would be for any individual station to be closed, however few people are using it. Um, but I do question that if you think about the way that uh, getting to stations will change, I mean, we can all place bets as to when autonomous vehicles may bring any of us to the station and that vehicle will then just turn around and go off somewhere else. Um, the speed with which, long before that, the speed with which demand responsive transport is now bringing people to transport hubs in a way that is not possible. It's not just about scheduled bus services to fix points where scheduled services only run. I think we do have to face a challenge. In many places, the, 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 the population or the development has morphed. It has moved. And I think it would be right to go through a challenge process. I mean, something else which a number of people in this room have heard me say, this is a retail estate for which we don't have profit and loss accounts for every one of our retail assets. And it's very strange to me that in this industry, we're all very aware of the costs of the industry in almost every other respect, but we don't simply look at them. And I, eventually, I came from another <coughs> consumer retail background. I'd never, ever imagine having 2,500 outlets without knowing what each one of them was going to cost, what the 10-year investment plan was going to have to be for each one of those. It's unthinkable to have an estate like that and not to be saying we should look at how we improve that estate as we go along, as how we move up and down the high street or we move up and down, dare I say, the A40, which I also know well. So I think we do have to face what are challenging decisions. Every time a local amenity closes and we're all, you know, we're all party to it, whether it's our local bank, our local post office, or our local community hospital. We're facing those choices. I think it's right in order that we have the debate that we do look in some areas at what would be difficult decisions, but where there would be a greater provision of good for a greater number of users. Let's take another question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mike here from uh, Transportation Professional Magazine. Um, Lord Adonis, you touched briefly on Crossrail and saying that the interchanges are terrible. I just wondered if you could give us a few examples, and is it too late, seeing that we've got perhaps another year of construction left on the scheme, to perhaps, I don't know, retrofit or improve the situation through wayfinding, and should HS2 perhaps learn some lessons from the terrible example on Crossrail? 
Well, um, it's too late. It's obviously too late. You can't, you can't move. The, the problem is the interchanges between lines. And by the way, they're very, very bad on a lot of modern projects. I said St Pancras, the Jubilee line is terrible. I mean, the, the interchange at, the, at Waterloo, at London Bridge, at um, Green Park, between major lines, like, you know, the Piccadilly line, uh, um, uh, the Piccadilly line, Jubilee line. In Ch- and well, how on earth was that allowed to happen? Um, and, you know, it's, it's terrible, a lot of these modern ones. And the crossrail ones are very bad. Indeed, one of the things I was able to stop is there was a proposal to have no interchange at all at below ground level at Bond Street between crossrail and, uh, and the Jubilee line. That was changed then because it was going to be a cost saving thing. But there's still very long. I mean, the, the, the length that you have to walk is, 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 is very long on a lot of them. We did learn a lesson on it. It was a particular thing in my mind because I'm a bit of a micromanager on these things, at the design of Old Oak Common. I saw Old Oak, Old Oak Common as being, I hoped, I mean, it's still too far. I couldn't, I, I couldn't persuade, unfortunately, David Rowlands to recommend that I had a jolly good go uh, having a cross-platform interchanges between HS2 trains and, and crossrail changes, at, trains at, um, at Old Oak Common, which is what should happen. That is, if you're putting the customer, the passenger at the centre, that should happen. But the, uh, my good friend, Andrew McNaughton, who I hugely admire and respect, he, he blinded me with a lot of engineering science, and I, I didn't, because unfortunately we then went on to lose the elections. So I didn't have time to sort it. I would have sorted it. I would have got those cross plans. I would have just sat there for hour after hour with the plans with him to have got it. I couldn't, unfortunately, get that far. But it's not bad, and it's a huge sight better than at Euston. Uh, which is going to be terrible for the, uh, the interchanges between HS2 and the underground. It's going to hold, involve, involve massive walks and all of that. And it's a particular... Sorry, you're get, I mean, you're interested. I mean, again... <laughs> the, sorry. The, the, the problem with high-speed trains is that they're so long. And so what you need, if you're going to have good interchanges, is you need to have the, the interchanges and the escalators and going down at strategic points along, which is a basic point, because I'm a layman on this, but it is not done on most high-speed stations. And the one that is worst of all is, of course, St Pancras, where you have to walk miles to get off the, uh, um, these 400-metre trains and in, into, uh, into the... That's not, it's made worse at St Pancras because of the, the, the hangover of the customs arrangements and all that but it's still very bad and that unfortunately looks to me as if it's still that lesson hasn't been learnt in the design of the of the uh, hs2 stations but the one that is the best of them is old oak common where there is at least a reasonably short interchange what's going to happen because because the passengers are very wily on these things is when people realize if you go through to euston you've got a 10 minute journey to get from the train to the underground but at uh, Old Oak Common, you can go across the bridge. I reckon there's going to be ma- um, mass diversion of traffic because of that fact alone to Old Oak Common. And I suspect Old Oak Common's capacity constraint is going to be exposed quite quickly. But on the interchange thing, which has been got wrong there, which, again, I couldn't do, and I tried to get it changed, I was at the National Infrastructure Commission, still didn't, is the interchange at Old Oak Common, though, with uh, the uh, overground going north-south, again, is terrible. There isn't going to be a station. Amazingly, amazingly, there is not going to be an overground station at Old Oak Common. You've got two, which are all at some distance, a long distance, many hundreds of metres from the station, which shouldn't be happening. So um, it has all been done very, very badly at the moment, and uh, it must all be Chris Grayling's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, I don't know if you... Did you want to talk about interchange and how you're working with HS2 and Network Rail around at Euston? Um... I know it's early yes. days. I mean, it's, it, yeah, it, well, it's, it's at a, a very early stage, and I think you know, the key to Euston ulti- ultimately is an integrated design solution um, so that the passenger experience can be as good as possible. But it was interesting uh, mentioning retail before. Um, I learned um, a couple of months ago that the, um, the highest grossing retail um, unit in the whole of Europe actually is um, the Harry Potter stand at uh, King's Cross Station. <laughs> and I, I don't think anyone probably would have uh, had the foresight to think like that. So if there is anyone in the audience who knows how to write a book or a good film like Paddington, I think Euston could do with that, uh, <laughs> that uh, okay. thinking ahead. But so, and that wasn't just a plan to get off uh, the, the story about integrated design. Um, yeah, I mean, our, our role is the developer, and the developer deli- to deliver, pr- first and foremost, over, oversight development. 
Um, but we are right now working very closely with HS2 and Network Rail about how that integration can happen. Um, and I don't think it's too late. Um, you know, I think if you look at Euston, yeah, the trains, the HS2 trains will be 450 metres long, um, which means to the north, they're actually in Mornington Crescent. Yeah. Um, so f from a place perspective, <laughs> Um, you know, and Camden are key drivers of this, is how do you actually restore those east-west links? So actually, fundamentally, the place operates differently. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thought process that a, a developer can bring to the table because we don't think rail first and foremost. So there's a lot of opportunity there still. Thanks, Rob. Take another question. Yes. It's Alex Wynn from New Civil Engineer. Slight follow-up for both Lord Adonis and for Rob. Um, what is it that's the key lesson to be learnt then from Crossrail and how are you not going to get it as wrong as, as has been got in some, certain circumstances there? And, well, sorry, for Lord Adonis as well. Like, does something like this cause great problems for politicians making the case for um, redeveloping stations in the future? Okay. So learning the lessons from, from Crossrail's delays, really, and making sure it plays its part in London's development. What can we learn for HS2, I guess? Well, Crossrail, the, the, the over budget and, and long delays in Crossrail are doing huge damage to the case for national infrastructure investment. I mean, I need to be completely frank with you, huge damage. Uh, Crossrail 2 is basically not going to happen now. I mean, it's not for a long period of time. There's no way government is going to commit to, to it for a good while. Um, uh, the, there's been a, a, an initial delay to HS2 phase two. I think it's beyond the point of no return. And uh, I was very encouraged from um, Nick Bisson, who's a, a fantastic, if he doesn't mind my saying so, one of the best officials in, in, uh, in, in the government, indeed one of the very few able officials in the government at the moment who's not having to work on Brexit, which is a, a very positive thing, because <laughs> almost all of them are. So most, most members of the government at the moment are see, working out how to trash the country. Nick is one of the few who's actually working out how to improve it, which is great. <laughs> and he tells me that, in fact, the delay which I'd thought was the curse of grayling, which meant we're going to have several years delay on HS2 phase two, is at the moment only six months to a year. I hope that's true. True, but the problem is that with the massive cost overruns on HS2 phase one, plus what's happening in Crossrail, I suspect my friends in the Treasury will do their damnedest to try and push that six months to a year back to two years, back to three years, because it's very easy to move these things to the right. But Crossrail 2, which is urgently needed <coughs> for London, desperately needed, has now essentially been, uh, uh, been suspended as a result of the delays to the original Crossrail. So it's not the thing that's going to, because of course Crossrail will be a huge success when it's open, even though the interchanges are terrible and all that, it'll be like the Jubilee Line, we'll be so massively relieved at long last, we've got some modern uh, transport infrastructure that, that works, that the fact that it could have been a, a, a lot better will be, will be discounted. So getting Crossrail open is the main thing, and it being open will it, itself act as a mess, massive, exemplar for, for future projects. But of course, we can design these things much, much better than we need to. Uh, just two other points on interchanges I haven't been able to uh, uh, address. Uh, uh, we're still very, very bad at getting interchanges with other public transport. Uh, one of the things I was hot on when I was transport secretary was interchanges with, with cycling. I was, uh, I was very influenced by Holland which does, has brilliant cycling interchanges, at, not just at, in Amsterdam, but all of its major regional stations too. We still do not, do not have a single station that I'm aware of in England, which is as good as any Dutch station that I've uh, visited when it comes to cycling interchanges. We still haven't worked out how to have cycle hire companies that operate at stations because I haven't worked out how to get the bikes to and from. I mean, the London cycle scheme the, what, the Barclays, what's it now? It's not Barclays, uh, Santander scheme, doesn't operate at stations. I mean, this is surreal. I mean, if I, I can see the speech I make of our transport secretary now, what is supposed to be the bike hire scheme to promote the use of bikes doesn't operate at the place where most people want to hire bikes because they haven't worked out how to get the bikes to and from it. The problem I was told with a straight face by the guy at TF TFL who runs this is if we had a cycle hire scheme at any of our, uh, uh, I mean, there's a small one at Waterloo and one to others, but they're small and they're not advertised, they're not mainstream, people would use it in too larger numbers. So we can't have it. <laughs> I, know, I mean, these things need to... If I was, again, the minister, I'd be cracking through these things and trying to sort them in a serious way. And as for buses, they're, they're by and large still very, very bad. And I, I'm struck as I've gone on this thing 
uh, on my tour now, how many bus stations <coughs> and coach interchanges in our regional um, stations, and indeed our city ones, all of them, are some way away from the, the, the railway station? I could go through a whole a list of, the, of, of ones where, I, where that's the case. And whose job is it to sort these things out? This is the, the constant problem too. So I, I'm very anxious that you're not complacent, all of you, because you're all working this. I hope you get a message from me that no complacency. <laughs> what you've got to understand is that far too little has changed. There are some exemplars of things that have gone well. And I, I, actually, I approach myself, whoever it was who mentioned London Bridge. London Bridge is great. That has come out well. Uh, uh, and, and that is, I think, could, could well be the, the, the best case of the last 10 years of something that's really, really working well. But mostly it doesn't work well at the moment. Exceptionally, it works well. And we need the, the, um, the, the best to become the norm, which it isn't. Simon, have you mentioned Well, I think uh, in, in part it's back to that whole debate around institutional relationships again that, that a lot of the time holds back um, the issue of integration. So from a positive perspective... Uh, a good example I can give you uh, is the work that we've done recently at, at Bolton uh, Railway Station, relocated the bus station from sitting around the back of the town, almost forgotten, uh, to a facility that is immediately linked into the, into the railway station, a short sky bridge that uh, links, uh, links the two together. Unfortunately, just at the point that we opened Bolton Interchange was the point that we faced all of the issues in terms of the delays around electrification and the debacle uh, uh, there. However, we are now looking forward to having a, a, an interchange that's, that's that's got a better rail service running into it and, and is well complemented. But those issues in terms of cycle interchange are, are classic institutional issues. A lot of the time, station managers are very concerned to see an additional disruption introduced into what is too often generally seen as a collection of liabilities rather than a collection of assets um, at, at a railway station. And I think, I think we have got to fundamentally uh, change that, that, that sort of approach. Um, I just wanted to come back to the new station point for a moment as well. Sure. There's a key issue in terms of new stations. New stations are part of networks. And it's only once we start thinking about how we introduce the right additional capacity into our networks that we can have a sensible conversation about new stations. So the work that we're walking forward now around new stations is built around us resolving the issues around the central Manchester hub. Frankly, if you don't resolve the issues around our central hubs, you can't have a sensible um, conversation around new stations. And we think that's a combination of some of those measures that have been on the table for quite some time uh, around the Manchester hub and also where we now take ourselves in terms of tram train, starting to make use of some of the other rail capacity that we have in our city centre and starting to take more of those trains out of the train shed uh, and elsewhere. If we do that, then we no longer think about uh, new stations from a constrained perspective. We think about it in terms of best use of new capacity across the system. Okay. Ian, you've got a question? Just one down in the middle. Hi, Ian Lindsay from Aspire. Um, just interested to hear the panel's thoughts. Uh, what would they say are the best stations in the world and which are those that are the biggest opportunities for improvement? You can now confess your holiday patterns and travels. I mean, uh, we, we, we're particularly seized at the moment by um, the, the approach to vertical integration that, that we see in some of those big contemporary German railway stations. Um, in particular, they feel incredibly relevant <laughs> given the importance of uh, land in and around our stations. To pick up on, on Jeremy's point from, from before, when I was a small child going to Manchester Piccadilly Station, it was the last place in the world that anybody wanted to put any money um, into, into the ground. We, we had an old fire station building which has sat opposite Manchester Piccadilly Station for decades doing nothing, a boutique hotel. <laughs> and apartments are now moving into that fire station directly across the road from the station because that's the way that people uh, and developers uh, view the land now. So the role of vertical movement within a railway station in the future to us feels incredibly important because otherwise we end up with stations that, that sprawl across our city centres um, and, and don't make best use of the regeneration opportunity. What's the biggest opportunity in Manchester <coughs> Piccadilly, of course it is. <laughs> What do you think is the best station in the world? 
I, it's a very interesting question. I, 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 have, to, I have to be honest, I, I, I wasn't a collector of top trumps cards when I was, I was a child. And, 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 and I tend to cut, 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 come at transport from a, a place perspective rather than a station perspective. Uh, but I am, I am really seized by the way that, that, that the Germans have, have come again um, at, their, at their stations and thought about how they can manage the impact of their stations within the city space. Hmm. Oh, so I'm unqualified to talk. So I'd probably just say Sodor because it's the station I kind of see most uh, every night when I, when I am home to read books to my, my kids. Uh, it always seems to work. It seems to be quite tidy. <coughs> Everyone knows what they're doing. Um, I do. I, I like Westminster Station, to be honest, um, uh, but that's more a stylistic thing than anything right. else. And of course, I'm going to say Euston is the biggest opportunity because uh, it just uh, <laughs> just is. Sorry, <laughs> Jer Jeremy. Um, I'm going to deliberately go to completely the other end of the scale because we've been talking tonight. We have two and a half thousand stations in this country, um, and I think the answer to the question, in all fairness, is you know fit for purpose. Mm. So let me go right to the other end of the scale. DLR stations, uh, when they were built, they're unmanned. Um, they broadly look alike. Uh, to my mind, they were cost-effectively built. I believe that they're reasonably cost-effective to maintain. They're relatively simple structures. Uh, they provide, to my mind, not enough now, but they provide reasonable weather cover. I would actually criticize them for that now. But in terms of fitness for purpose, I would say in Manchester Metrolink, I would credit as being others. I think there are some fitness for purpose stations out there that we've all got to learn from. I actually put up on the screen as I went through tonight, there was a building um, that was a community center. For all the world, you could have looked at that photograph and thought it was a station. It's a community center actually in Northamptonshire. And I happened to look up. That community center co cost just over two million pounds to build. Now, if we were trying to build the comparable railway station, that would cost the railway industry an awful lot more yeah. than that sum of money to build that facility. And this is, again, where I think we have to look much more radically at fit for purposeness of many of our stations. I mean, I'm, I, I'm simply not going to um, the, the, the big largest station in the world that one can mm. think of. I think there are a number of contenders, and we've all yeah. talked very complimentarily tonight about St Pancras, and I, you know, it would certainly be one of those. But I really think we need to focus on a lot more of the mid and small ground and say, what are some of the best ones of those and, and learn from those? Mm. Andrew? I, I, I agree with what Jeremy says. I think there's a... I mean, the station, which is the biggest wow factor, I mean, is, is the new Berlin Hauptbahnhof. But that's phenomenally expensive. And uh, only a few years after it was built, they closed it because they had to make major repairs. Yeah. And so, I mean, the idea that the Germans always get everything right is, and of course, Stuttgart, I mean, the controversies around that and the costs yeah. are phenomenal. Is that finished yet? No. It's still going ahead, isn't it? So, so uh, the, the, they, they are good at doing these integrated, but part of the reason why they can do them in Germany, of course, is because they do have the, the con, you know, because of the way that their railway was built in the 19th century, mm. they do have these central city stations, which mm. are, were integrated from the outset, whereas we didn't have them so much in, uh, in, in, in Britain. But Jeremy's completely right. How do you get really cost-effective and successful local stations, which are also social and transport it hubs and mm. Docklands looking at a model of how you do it cost effectively Docklands must be the model I mean there's no one else that's, that's built a, rail, a railway network anywhere remotely as, as cheaply in Britain and of course it involved massive controversy at the time because people thought it was under engineered it was you know, having the driverless trains the unstaffed stations and all of that was very controversial at the time but it has worked so uh, it's uh, the compare and contrast is really interesting Laurie. We've got the last couple of minutes, I think. So probably got one more question. Let me get yourself ready. Norrie Courts, Director of Stations from a company called Network Rail. Uh, it's really interesting hearing all the different views and certainly some controversial. Would it be the best idea then just to take all the railway stations off Network Rail and the train operating companies and give them to regional asset management companies and then just provide a service level agreement back to the respective train operating companies uh, or whoever, to, to then use those stations as required. Could Lendlease run all the stations in the UK? <laughs> what, was that an offer? Uh, <laughs> Depends what you're offering. 
So, I mean, so, certainly from our perspective, that's, that's pretty much the model that we put on the table through, uh, through the case for change. Uh, and we put it on the table uh, because we thought that we could bring a long-term, uh, more relevant uh, perspective to, to the table in the context of our local stations. And that we could also work, because we are ultimately owned by, we could work with the 10 local planning authorities in Greater Manchester to really bring about regeneration opportunities around the station. So that that was the purpose, that was the thinking behind our, our proposition. And obviously there was a lot of issues involved in that in terms of safety and still running a safe railway. Indeed. Yeah. And it's partnership, I think, that's what we're looking for. A Andrew, you mentioned a station mm. curve as a potential solution. Mm. It's one of the I, I, I would agree with that model. I don't necessarily be Lendley, so would do them, because of course you have different contracts and ha yeah. in, in different places and people do it in, in different ways. Uh, but I, I'd be, I would be inclined to do it. No, uh, and the, uh, all of the developments in the last 10 years have reinforced my view, because it, uh, the network rail hasn't found a way of, of constantly replicating and, and cut it uh, and doing station um, uh, modernizations in a way that cascades and accelerates, which is what I'd hope is what I was told. Because I always compare now, because it's 10 years since I did the stations report, what I was told then and what's happened now. I was told that that you were developing, not you, I mean, Network Rail was developing, well, it is you, isn't it? But it is. It is. <laughs> no, it's not me, Lord Adonis, yes, thank uh, you. It's uh, not net, me. Network Rail was, was, was developing a model that meant they would be able to accelerate and rapidly replicate and learn from the success of, uh, of, 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 of projects and they would get the cost down and all that. None of that's been true. But the other thing that really c concerns me about this too is that the, is that the core business of Network Rail, which of course is managing and upgrading the track, I mean, that has been done terribly in the last 10 years. I mean, the Great Western modernization, I'm afraid, is up there with probably worse in proportionate terms than Crossrail in terms of cost overruns, poor design, massive grief that it's causing to local communities. I mean, everywhere I go, you know, all, uh, Bristol, I mean, Bristol Temple Meads isn't even going to be electrified on the new plan. South Wales, where it's not going through to Swansea and all that, just the basic stuff that Network Rail should be doing of, of running a modern railway, the engineering stuff, it's, it's not doing well. It's not doing it terribly. I mean, the thing I always latch onto is we have not had a major rail accident since Greywig. Mm -hmm. and, and that is no mean a, a achievement. Our, our railway appears to me, because let me give applaudive, our railway appears to me to run more safely than any comparable railway in the world, much more safely than the Germans, actually. Mm -hmm. The Germans have had a, a number of serious rail accidents in recent years. So, so the, 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 the network has clearly got something right in terms of the safe operation of the railway, which is a big, big plus and a huge factor in public confidence, by the way. So let me give credit where it's due. What it hasn't been good at doing is, in a cost-effective way, conducting and carrying through modernisations. And that's of its core assets, let alone the stations. So uh, I, I think the case for, for doing something radical with stations is, is right. And what I'd be inclined to do, where you've got a, a mayor like Andy Burnham in, the, in Greater Manchester, because, you know, is suck it and see, is, is do a transfer of the stations there, give it 10 years, see how it works, and work out what the implications of that might be for the rest of the country, because it's not as if it's being done so well at the moment that we can't improve it. That would be my, my, the way I would handle it if I was the minister at the moment uh, on this. And uh, I, I, where you've got a, a, a willing partner, I think Network Rail might be a willing partner in this. Uh, and of course, you know, you'd have to redesign the, the, the TOC contracts as well because of the other stations. Do it. Uh, maybe Andy doesn't want all the st uh, If I were him, I wouldn't necessarily want them all at the moment, but I, I might want sort of 20 or 30 and take those and, and do those in a serious way. Um, no, he then, absolutely does. <laughs> he, he wants them all, does he? Completely. Oh, well, you know, I mean, that's a discussion to be had. Uh, but if I was network well, I would not be clinging on to these things if I had somebody like Andy Burnham who was prepared to take them off, off my hands and, uh, and, and, and do service level agreements on them. So we'll just take one last question, if we may, just at the far end there. Hello, Virginia Phillips from London Stations, and uh, we'd be very delighted to take your stations oh, off your hands and, uh, <laughs> and run them. Um, so, um, particularly Waterloo, actually, rather than Manchester. Sorry about that, Simon. Um, so, my question to the panel is around retail and the retail experience on stations. Now, in my view, we should be looking at solving customers' everyday problems. So going to a barber's, getting your dry cleaning done, being able to post a parcel. And these are the sorts of services as a core 
repeated across the major stations that we really should be seeing. And the boutiques and the higher value um, shops that we love at St Pancras have a place, but we have to get that core right. Of course, the only problem with these kinds of places, and I've been to Marylebone this, this week, it's not my station I commute into, um, but the guy that can cut your key for you or repair your shoes has now given up his tenancy because he can't afford to pay the increase in rent that Arriva are now uh, charging. And uh, unfortunately, the barbers, who's been there for about 11 years or more, you'll tell me, um, is also about to give up his tenancy. So how do we square this circle about um, providing these services, which I think passengers really should have, but perhaps on paper they're not the most lucrative tenants mm. in the short term? Mm. Well, if you had, uh, if, if Andy Burnham or and a public authority was a franchising authority, of course, what they would do is want a balanced portfolio of including your barbers, your, your key cutter and all that there, because they wouldn't just be seeking to maximise the rents. Whereas, unfortunately, what's happening at the moment is a philosophy of rent maximisation, which is driving some of these things out of business. But the bigger issue... It, it, why why people, wouldn't they be maximising the rents? Why would they have a different value structure? Well, I don't I mean, he'd have the opportunity to, because he's a public official. He's not having to... Uh, maximise uh, his shareholder return. So are you and, saying and a private Randy, company no, couldn't do that? No, and, it's, uh, and that's uh, absolutely right. Within the model that we put forward, uh, we saw the potential for stations to act as um, uh, local health mm. facilities. We saw a whole range mm. uh, of, of community and, and, and retail opportunities uh, across mm. our stations. And, mm. and taking that longer term perspective mm. across the estate as well does mean that you can choose to take a certain amount of risk, you can choose to balance the portfolio. Mm. I think um, one thing I'd add to that, I completely agree. When you look at a place and there's, you know, fragmented responsibilities, you tend to look at your own kind of piece of the pie, mm. um, whereby if you're looking at the whole kind of equation on an operational management basis, it's kind of criminal that you'd have 40 or 70 million people going through a station um, with empty retail units. So for example, if you take Houston as an example, when you have uh, office space to let, or you've got you know, biomedical research facilities, there, there are other areas of the estate that will earn the value that absolutely need all the convenience, all the you know, public services that go with it. So you're looking at more of a holistic view of the whole place rather than just someone being accountable for the retail and maximising the output of that. OK, I'm afraid I have to draw it to close. I've had evil stares from my colleagues tell me to shut up and keep the panel, panel moving. Um, thank you very much for your questions and answer. Thank you very much to the panel. It falls to me to try and summarise what we've heard. And the good news is you were pretty consistent, I think. Um, we certainly here heard about clarity of accountability, that this complex estate needs a single commanding, controlling mind in some form. We heard about the need for that plan around... What's the community engagement? How do we maximise the return to that catchment population, if you want? How do we get long-term thinking around the development and management of the asset? How do we bring alongside the commercial return with the wider social and economic return, recognising that actually to do that, you do need to pull different organisations and perspectives together? We heard tough challenges that we haven't gone far enough. We cannot be complacent. Jeremy alluded to the change in demographics, the changing technology agenda, and therefore those who manage or develop our stations are going to have to keep up to speed and continue up with those developments. Fundamentally, we need to have that one public estate, which I think Simon talked about. How do we bring housing alongside our station developments to make them sing for our communities? So that's all I'm going to say about stations. I think we've touched on the different perspectives. There's a challenge out there. Movement Matters continues in the next couple of months. We'll be doing some more of our events. Please check our website. The next one scheduled is an insight into our corporate re research and innovation program to give you some insights about some of the th techniques, some of the uh, issues we explore on that. But for now, that's the end. I'd like to thank the speakers once more. There are some drinks and nibbles outside where you had tea and coffee earlier. I do hope you'll join us and continue the debate. Thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>